Everyone, happy new year. I'd love to hear what you're reading. So if you send notes, Austin will let me see that later because I'm not looking at chat because then I will get distracted. Austin's going to keep track for Q&A at the end. Um, once again, before we start, um, Austin is going to be sharing a link during the presentation. And that link is the link that you should be um, going and filling out at the end of this event. The people who attend live, remember, are eligible one, one of the three prizes for sharing and letting us know which of the books today that you are most interested in. And this is super helpful to us for planning for future events. So um, he's gonna be putting that link up on the screen. And then um, it's also gonna be at the end of the presentation, but we're gonna keep it at the very end simply because um, those who are not live are not eligible to enter the contest. So it just goes like that, okay? Okay, we're gonna start with historical fiction today. I'm gonna, we usually start with fiction and Tom Donati and I had a huge discussion about why we're gonna do this this time. But uh, there are some really terrific books out and I wanna be making sure that they're on your radar right up front. The first is The Children's Blizzard by Melanie Benjamin. Uh, this book just came out yesterday and it's kind of interesting because it came out 133 years after the actual event that it's based on. On the morning of January 12th in 1888, it was an unusually mild morning after a really punishing cold spell. It was warm enough for the homesteaders in the Dakota Territory to venture out and for the children to return to school. Often when it was too cold, the children wouldn't go to school. And they were going without their heavy coats, leaving them unprepared when disaster struck later. At an hour when the prairie schools were letting out for the day, a terrifying, fast-moving blizzard flew in without warning. School teachers as young as 16 years old, and yes, you're reading that number right, uh, were suddenly faced with life or death decisions. Do they keep the children inside to risk freezing to death when fuel ran out or send them home, praying that they would not get lost in the storm? And these schoolhouses were like a mile or two from people's homes, but still, what was going to happen? It's based on actual oral histories of survivors, and it follows the stories of Raina and Gerda Olson, two sisters, both school teachers. One becomes a hero of the storm, and the other finds herself ostracized in its aftermath. I interviewed Melanie, and we have an interview with her that's up on this um, YouTube and on our podcast right now on Book Reporter Talks To. And we really get into what happens in this book because it's bigger than the storm. But we're also talking here about the migration west, about these people who are moving to this territory. A lot of them were immigrants that were um, came here and with an idea of being able to settle and have land. And we actually brought up something really interesting. This book is kind of bookend by these people's lives who were really young at that point. When you were older, the other end of your life was the depression. So it's really interesting to see how these people's lives were juxtapositioned of what happened. Um, it's, uh, I joke that you have to put on a warm coat to be wearing this book or reading this book because it's really, really chilling, um, literally when she's writing about the snow. And what you also have to realize is these people didn't have far to go. This wasn't 15 miles or whatever, but how blinding and how tough the snowstorm was. Um, it's a book reporter bets on selection and my commentary about it will be running on Friday. So we start with the children's blizzard. Next, we've got The Last Garden in England, which is by Julia Kelly. Um, this is out this week as well. And we've got three time periods here. In the first, Emma Lovett, who has dedicated her career to breathing life into long neglected gardens, has just been given the opportunity of a lifetime to restore the gardens of the famed Highbury House estate designed in 1907 by our hero, Venetia Smith. Okay, let's go to 1907. A talented artist with a growing reputation for her ambitious work, Venetia Smith has carved out a niche for herself as a garden designer to industrialists, solicitors, and bankers looking to show off their wealth with sumptuous country houses. 1944, when the war threatens Highbury House's treasured gardens, three very different women are drawn together by a secret that will last for decades three different time frames. This book is one of the selections that we're giving away in our winter reading contest. Austin, just correct me, is this the book that's up for the next 24 hours in the contest? Can you just remind me? Yes, it is. Okay, yes, so the- um, tomorrow. Yep, yeah. so entries to win copies of this book, um, one of five copies of this book went up just at noontime today. Our winter reading contests, if you don't remember, are those 24-hour contests like we do for summer reading, fall preview, holiday cheer, spring preview, where you receive details about the book and you have just uh, 24 hours to enter. So 
that one's up right now and you get a little like, you know, special reminder to go do that. Next, we've got Yellow Wife by Sakita Sadiqa Johnson. I actually heard her speak about this book, which was inspired by um, a day that she went out with her family on an outing and they were looking at some historical areas. And when they were there, she just got the idea for writing this book. Um, in it, um, uh, Pe Febby Dolores Brown was born on a plantation in Charles City, Virginia, and she's lived a relatively sheltered life. She was shielded by her mother's position as the estate's medicine woman and cherished by the master's sister. And she's set apart from others on the plantation, belonging to neither world. She's been promised freedom on her 18th birthday, but instead of the idyllic life she's imagined with her true love, Essex Henry, she is forced to leave the only pro home she's ever known. She unexpectedly finds herself thrust into the bowels of slavery at the infamous Devil's Half Acre, a jail in Richmond, Virginia, where enslaved are broken, tortured, and sold every day. There, she's exposed not to just to her jailer's cruelty, but to the, also to his contradictions. To survive, she's going to have to outwit him, and soon she faces the ultimate sacrifice. I read this. This is going to be a book reporter uh, bets on. I'm really looking forward to interviewing the author. We're trying to get that set up right now. Just a very interesting book about this time in the South and what this woman ended up doing. So we've got Yellow Wife for you. Next, we've got Kristen Hanna's The Four Winds. And I know many, many, many of you, this was the top book when we last asked of what you were looking forward to reading. Uh, it's coming out on February 2nd, so we're giving you a heads up about this one, time enough to pre-order. Of course, it's a book reporter bets on selection. It starts in Texas, 1934. Millions are out of work, and a drought has broken the Great Plains. Farmers are far fighting to keep their land and their livelihoods as crops are failing. The water's drying up and the dust threatens to bury them all. One of the darkest periods of the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl era has arrived with a vengeance. In this uncertain and dangerous time, Elsa Martinelli, like so many of her neighbors, must make an agonizing choice. Fight for the land she loves or go west to California in search of a better life. So we've got the four wins. For any of you who are in a book group, we know that this will be a great book group uh, selection. We want you to know that right now we're running a contest on readinggroupguides.com where 30 groups will win 12 digital, audio, um, digital audios for their group to be able to listen to this book together or listen to this book separately, but discuss together. And also um, to be able to listen to the uh, interview that uh, is done between the narrator, who's Julia Whalen, who has done a number of Kristen's books, and also um, Kristen to be talking about this book. And those are always so interesting. It's a little behind the book with the author. So we've got that for you. The contest is open until February 3rd on Reading Group Guides. You need to be in a book group to do this because we're going to be looking forward to feedback from the groups as well. So if your group is up for listening to audio and sharing, this is something that you may be interested in doing. Uh, the Reading Group Guys newsletter is probably going to go out either on Thursday night or Friday morning. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, do, because it's a great, a great way to find out what's happening for book clubs this month um, and every month. We usually do that newsletter twice a month. We update the site twice a month. And it's really interesting. We've learned how many groups are continuing to meet, even in the midst of pandemic. People really did pivot quickly to Zoom. Um, my group, we met out, one of my groups, we met outside by a fireplace for a really long time, um, fire pit, which was actually funny because it was outside the firehouse was the fire pit. Um, but this time we're going to be we're, uh, by Zoom for our next meeting. So kind of interesting to be able to do that. Um, next, we've got The Nature of Fragile Things by Sue Meisner, which is all snow coming out on February 2nd. In it, Sophie Whalen is a young Irish immigrant, so desperate to get out of a New York tenement that she answers a mail order bride ad and agrees to marry a man she knows nothing about. San Francisco widower Martin Hawking prov uh, proves to be as aloof as he is mesmerizingly handsome. Sophie quickly develops deep affection for Kat, Martin's silent five-year-old daughter, but Ma Martin's odd behavior leaves her with an uneasy feeling that something about her newfound situation isn't right. Then, one early spring evening, a stranger at the door sets in motion a transforming chain of events. Sophie discovers hidden ties to two other women. The first, pretty and pregnant, is standing on her doorstep. The second is hundreds of miles away in the American Southwest, grieving the loss of everything she once loved. 
the fates of these three women intertwine on the eve of the devastating earthquake. So we've got the nature of fragile things. Next, we've got the Paris Library. Um, this is a book that if some of you have heard about this book before. It was actually supposed to come out last May, and they postponed it because they wanted to make sure that it got uh, as much, uh, uh, many readers behind it, you know, before the book came out. And Janet Skelson, Skelsian Charles, I actually did a quick interview with last year, and I want to get her on again um, when we were at Winter Institute. Uh, this book is a number one indie pick, and she is just, you know, really on top of her game with this story. It's coming out on February 9th. Um, here we've got Paris 1939, young and ambitious. Odile Suchet has it all, her handsome police officer Beau, a dream job at the American Library in Paris. When the Nazis march into Paris, she stands to lose everything she holds dear, including her beloved library. Together with her fellow librarians, she joins the resistance with the best weapon she has, books. But when the war part finally ends, instead of freedom, she chases the bitter sting of unspeakable betrayal. Let's flash forward to Montana in 1983. Lily is a lonely teenager looking for adventure in small town Montana. Her interest is piqued by her solitary elderly neighbor. As Lily uncovers more about her neighbor's mysterious past, she finds they share a love of language, the same longings and the same intense jealousy, never suspecting that a dark seek from the past connects them. I've read most of this book. I'm going to probably get that Betsong um, button going on uh, next time we talk about this book, but she absolutely does a terrific job. She lives in Paris now and is just a wonderful, wonderful person. I want to hear more about what this book and the background and how she came to write it. Next, we're going to go to fiction. We're going to start out with The Perfect Guest, which is by Emma Roos, which is, uh, she's the best-selling author of The Au Pair. Many of you will remember that book. It's on sale this week. Once again, we've got two time frames here. In 1988, Beth Soames is 14 year old when her aunt takes her to stay at Raven Hill, a rambling manor in the isolated East Anglian uh, Fens. The Averills, the family who lives there, are warm and welcoming, and Beth becomes fast friends with their daughter, Nina. At times, Beth even feels like she's truly part of the family until they ask her to help them with a harmless game and nothing is ever the same. 2019, Sadie Langton is an actress struggling to make ends meet when she lands a well-paying gig to pretend to be a guest at a weekend party. She sent a suitcase of clothing, a dossier outlining the role she is to play, and instructions. It's strange, but she needs the money, and when she sees the stunning manner she'll be staying at, she figures, nothing to lose. In person, Raven Hall is even grander than she imagined, even with damage from a fire decades before. But the walls seem to have eyes, as day turns into night, Sadie starts to feel like there's something off about the glamorous guests who arrive. And as the party begins, it becomes chillingly apparent that their unseen host is playing games with everyone, including her. Next, we've got What Could Be Saved by Lisa O'Halloran Schwartz. Um, this book is one of my favorites of, um, that I've just recently read. I read it over the holiday. And it's funny because there's a quote from Lisa C. on the front of it that says, Ex exquisite and memorable. And as I was reading it, I said, you know, Lisa would love, love this book. I've got to tell her about it. And wouldn't you know, she'd already read it and blurbed it. Um, I have an interview uh, with Lisa that's up on the site this week. And this is a book reporter bets on selection. Let me tell you why I love it. Book is set in Washington, uh, opens in Washington in 2019. Laura Preston is an artist at odds with her older sister B as their elegant mother slowly sl uh, slides into depression, uh, dementia. And all of a sudden she's contacted by a stranger and the claiming to know her brother who uh, disappeared 40 years earlier when the family lived in Bangkok. Laura, against the best wishes of her sister B, flies to Taiwan to see if it could be true but when she meets her brother in person, this is someone she hasn't seen in 40 years, there's so many questions. What happened to him the day he disappeared? What's happened to him in these four decades? What, what are all the events that led up to this? So now let's flash back. We're in Bangkok in 1972. Genevieve and Robert Preston live in a home behind a high wall, a beautiful home, raising their three children with the help of a cadre of servants. In these exotic uh, surroundings, Genevieve serves to, uh, strives to create a semblance of the life they would have had at home in the United States. Kids go to ballet. The, uh, she hosts beautiful parties. Just everything is like the life she had in Washington, D.C., which she absolutely loved. 
but you know, it's kind of trying to be in Bangkok because there are things like snakes, malaria, uh, dysentery, but she's maintained this very high image. Something happens with her on um, one day and there's something that happens that collides with all these different things with the family and his brother goes missing and the family has to leave Bangkok and come home without him. So there are parallel stories of what happened leading up to the, the, the time when he was disappeared, what happened to him along the way, what happens after they find each other. It's so well done. Started out as a short story. It ends up that um, Lisa, when she was growing up, her family lived in Bangkok. And um, she just had a little short story that she had written somewhere and you know played around with that grew into this book. It alternates between the past and the present. All the secrets are revealed. It's one of those books that's like the wavers of an onion as you're peeling them all back. And you're like, wow, that's what really happened. About a family shattered by loss and betrayal and beauty that can exist even in the midst of brokenness. Um, this book was actually turned on to me by a number of indie bookseller friends who just loved it. Next, we've got the How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones. And this is another winter reading selection. It's coming out on February 2nd. I read 50 pages of this book a long time ago, a long while back, pre-pub. We're looking at it for something. And it was it's just so well done in voice and tone and setting. In Baxter's Beach Barbados, Layla's grandmother, Wilma, tells the story of the one-armed sister, it's a cautionary tale about what happens to girls who dissipate their mothers and go into Baxter's tunnels. When she's grown, Lala lives on the beach with her husband, Adon, a petty criminal with endless charisma, who's thwarted burglary of one of the beach mans and sets off a chain of events with terrible circumstances. A gunshot no one meant to witness, a new mother whose baby is found lifeless on the beach, a woman torn between two worlds incapacitated by grief, and two men driven into the tunnels by desperation and greed, who attempt a crime that will wish their freedom and their lives. Voice on this is really great. I love this cover. I just think it's like, you know, really terrific. So there we've got um, The One-Armed uh, Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones. Next, we've got The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. Again, another winter reading read. In it, Ruth Tuttle, an Ivy Greek Ivy League educated black engineer is married to a kind and successful man. He's eager to start a family. She's uncertain. She's never gotten over the baby she gave birth to and was forced to leave when she was a teenager. Returning home, Ruth discovers that the Indiana factory town of her youth is plagued by unemployment, racism, and despair. As she begins digging into the past, she unexpectedly become, befriends Midnight, a young white boy who's also adrift and looking for connection. Just as Ruth is about to uncover a burning secret her family desperately wants to keep hidden, a traumatic incident strains the town's already searing racial tensions, sending Ruth and Midnight on a collision course that could upend both of their lives. So, Next, we've got Truly Like Lightning by David Duchovny. Tom, did I say that right? Duchovny. David Duchovny, Duchovny, we've been practicing that all morning. It's coming out on February 2nd. I want you to note that this book is narrated by the author who's an actor. So there we go. Um, for the past 20 years, Bronson Powers, a former Hollywood stuntman and converted Mormon, has been homesteading deep in the uninhabited desert outside Joshua Tree with his three wives and 10 children. Bronson and his wives have been raising their family away from the corruption and evil of the modern world. Their insular existence is upended when the ambitious young developer Maya Abadap, okay, let me do this one, Abadessa, Abadessa, uh, stumbles upon their land. Maya, threatening to report the family to social services, convinces them to en enter three of their children into a nearby public school. Bronson and his wives agree that if Maya can prove that the kids do better in town than in the desert oasis, they will sail her a chunk of their priceless plot of land. Suddenly confronted with all the complications of the 21st century that they tried to keep out of their lives, the powers uh, must uh, reckon with their lifestyle as they try to save it. So I really love this cover. I think it's like one of those smashing kinds of covers. The cover is kind of interesting to me because it's like, what would, would not just come across my desk, but if I was in a store, what would really catch my eye or if I was in a library, what would do it? And something I think is really brilliant. 
Next, we've got This Close to Okay by Lisa Cross Smith, another winter reading selection. This is coming out also on February 2nd. On a rainy October night in Kentucky, recently divorced therapist Tally Clark is on her way home from work when she spots a man precariously standing at the edge of a bridge. Without a second thought, Tally pulls over, jumps out of her car, and into the pouring rain. She convinces the man to join her for a cup of coffee, and he eventually agrees to come back to her house, where he finally shares his name, Emmett. Over the course of the emotionally charged weekend that follows, Tally makes it her mission to provide a safe space for Emmett, though she hesitates to confess that this is also her day job. What she doesn't realize is Emmett isn't the only one who needs healing, and they're both harboring secrets. So there's this close to okay. Next, we're going to go into thrillers and mysteries, some category I know you love. I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. Category, thrillers and mysteries for 100. Okay, here we go. Um, this is Nick Petrie's The, the Breaker. It's a Peter Ash novel. I'm bringing this up not just because Nick Petrie's name is in my favorite color on the cover. Um, it's a series that I feel like has not gotten enough attention from readers, though I want to say this is either the fifth or sixth book in the series. Um, I actually gave them to my husband, the arbiter of you know guy thrillers, and he whipped through them all. He read all the past books, sat down, read The Breaker in a day as well. Um, so Nick is somebody that I think has gotten notice, but not enough attention. So I wanted to make sure it was part of this presentation. Um, a man wanted by two governments, Peter Ash has found a simple, low profile life in Milwaukee, living with his girlfriend June and renovating old buildings with his friend Lewis. Staying out of trouble is the key to preserving his fragile peace. But when Peter spots a suspicious armed man walking into a crowded market, he knows he can't stand by and do nothing. Um, Peter does interrupt a crime, but it isn't at all what he expected. The young gunman appears to have one target and one mission, but he escapes and his victim vanishes before the police arrive. It seems there's more to the encounter than meets the eye. But for Peter, even more is at stake. This investigation is his only path to a life free from the threat of prosecution or prison. Before the end, he'll have to fight harder than ever to, before to ensure the freedom doesn't come at too high a cost. So there we've got The Breaker by Peter um, by uh, Nick Petri. Um, if you haven't read any Nick's, of Nick's books before, you can come in on any of them, though I think starting at the beginning is always a good thing with the series, even if you read the first one and then continue from there. Next, we've got uh, The House on Vesper Sands, and this is by um, Parak, and let's see, I'm going to get his name right too, uh, Parak O'Donnell. Um, this is with all the wit of a Jane Austen novel and a case as beguiling as any Sherlock Holmes case book. Rock O'Donnell introduces us to a detective duo for the ages and slowly unlocks the secrets of a startling Victorian mystery. By turning smarts, surprising, and impossible um, put down, The House on Vesper Sands offers a glimpse into the strange undertow of late 19th century London and the secrets we all hold inside. And Helen MacDonald, for those of you who are fans of this book, of, of her work, is a huge fan of this book. It's going to be a winter reading giveaway. This book is getting tons and tons and tons of attention, so you definitely want it on your radar. I'm just looking at, there's a butterfly on this book as well. I feel like I maybe should have done a, a quiz of how many um, books have butterflies on the cover because there are more than one in this presentation. Next, we've got Lisa Gardner's Before She Disappeared. And for those who you know Lisa for her series titles, this is a standalone. And I'm actually going to be interviewing her next week. And I'm looking forward to doing that. I haven't seen or caught up with Lisa in a while. In this book, Frankie Elkins is an average middle-aged woman, recovering alcoholic with more regrets than belongings, but she spends her life doing what no one else will, uh, will, searching for the missing people the world has stopped looking for. When the police have given up, when the public no longer remembers, when the media has never paid attention, Frankie starts looking. A new case, case brings her to Mattapon, a Boston neighborhood with a rough reputation. She, she's searching for Angelique Badeau, Haitian uh, teenager who's disappeared from her high school months earlier. Resistance from the Boston PD and the victim's family, a wary, didn't really tell her, Frankie, she's on her own. And soon she learns she's asking questions that someone doesn't want answered. But Frankie will stop at nothing to discover the truth, even if it means the next person to go missing could be her. I'm about two thirds of the way through this book. It's very, very interesting because it's what this woman is trying to see and find that the police are kind of glossing over or what do they know that they don't want her to know. And there's also another missing girl as I'm reading in the pages and how are those two connected? 
Very, very interesting book. Next, we got Greg Hurwitz, uh, The Prodigal Son. Uh, it's coming out on January 26th. And yes, this is an Orphan X novel. Um, okay, so um, for those of you who don't know, um, Evan Smoke is Orphan X. Um, I also will confess, and I've confessed this to my husband, and um, it's really true, I have a huge crush on Evan Smoke. There, it's out. Um, as a boy, Evan Smoke was pulled out of a foster home and was trained in an off-the-books operation known as the Orphan Program. He was a government assassin, perhaps best known to few insiders as Orphan X. He broke with the program and adopted a new name, the Nowhere Man, and a new mission, helping the most desperate in their times of trouble. But the highest power in the country has made him a tempting author. In exchange for an unofficial pardon, he must stop his clandestine activities as the Nowhere Man. But then he gets a call for help from the one person he never expected, a woman claiming to have given him up for adoption, a woman he never knew, his mother. Her unlikely request, help Andrew Duran, a man whose life has gone off the rails. Evan is Duran's only option, but when the hidden cabal catches on to what Evan is doing, he's, everything he's fought for is on the line, including his own life. So there we've got the prodigal son. What's he gonna do next? Um, then we've got Jane Harper, The Survivors, which is another winter reading selection. Um, it's coming on February 2nd. Kieran Elliott's life changed forever on the day a reckless mistake led to a devastating consequences. The gill still haunts him, resurfacing during a visit with his uh, young family into the small coastal community he once called home. Kieran's parents are struggling in a town where fortunes are forged by the sea. Between them all is his absent brother, Finn. When a body is discovered on the beach, long-held secrets threaten to emerge, a sunken wreck, a missing girl, and questions that have never washed away. So there we've got survivors. Really eerie cover. I really, really love this. Um, another like, you know, chilling cover. You can see what's going to be happening. Next, we've got John Hart's The Un um, Unwilling. Many of you may remember him years ago from Redemption Road. It's another book. If you see places, it was supposed to come out last May and it was held back. It's coming out now on February 2nd. In it, Gibby's brother Jason won't speak of the war uh, of his time behind bars, but he wants a relationship with the younger brother he hasn't known for years. Determined to make that connection, he coaxes Gibby into a day at the lake with some older women. But the day turns ugly when they encounter a prison transfer bus on a stretch of empty road. One of the women taunts the prisoners, leading to a riot on the bus. The woman finds it funny in the moment, but is savagely murdered soon after. Given his violent history, suspicion first turns to Jason, but when the second woman is kidnapped, the police suspect, suspect Gibby too. Determined to prove Jason innocent, Gibby must avoid the cops and dive deep into his brother's hidden life. And what he discovers is a truth more disturbing than he could ever have imagined. So here we've got the unwilling. And I love that scene on the cliffs with the man standing above it. It's just like, what does happen here? Next, we're going to go to memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction. First up, we've got Aftershocks by Nadia Owusu. And I had the pleasure of hearing her talk about this book. Um, let's do a little bit about the title. Um, she had many things happen to her in her life, and she felt like she was living in a landmine of earthquakes. And as a result, the things that happened to her afterwards, she felt were all aftershocks. And it makes such an apt title for this book. In it, young Nadia Wusu followed her father, a United Nations official, from Europe to Africa and back again. Just as she and her family settled into a new home, her father would tell her it's time to say goodbye. The instability wrought by uh, Nadia's nomadic childhood was deepened by her family's secrets and fractures, both lived and inherited. Her Armenian-American mother, who abandoned Nadia when she was two, would periodically appear, only to vanish again. Her father, a Guyanian, was a great hero of her life, and he died when she was 13. After his passing, Nadia's stepmother weighed her down with a revelation that was either a bombshell a secret or a lie, rife with shaming innuendo. With these and other ruptures, she arrived in New York as a young woman, feeling stateless, motherless, and uncertain about her future, yet eager to find her own identity. 
what followed were periods of depression where she struggled to hold herself and her siblings together. And aftershocks is the way she hauled herself from the wreckage of her life's perpetual quaking, the means by which she's finally come to understand that the only firm ground enough, enough to count on is the one written to existence by her own hand. The, um, the, the uh, audio book of this is going to be, is narrated by her and she's got a really strong voice. I think that that's going to be the way to like kind of listen, give at least the sample part of it a listen so you can at least hear her voice. Um, so it's Aftershocks by Nadia Owusu. Next, we've got Land by Simon um, Winchester. It's Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. And you think about it, you're thinking back to the um, book that I, I talked about earlier, Melanie Benjamin, where people moved to, to get land. We're talking about Kristen Hanna's book, um, where people were moving to that part of the country, the Dust Bowl, and where this land was, it's not always uh, wonderful for people, but it's something that people really, really sought. And it's land, whether meadow or mountainside, desert or peak bog, parkland or pasture, suburb or city is central to our existence. Simon Winchester examines what we human beings are doing and have done with the billions of acres that together make up the solid surface of our planet. It examines in depth how we acquire land, how we steward it, how and why we fight over it, and finally, how we can and on occasion come to share it. So on occasion do come to share it. Ultimately, he confronts the essential question, who actually owns this world's land and why does it matter? This book is narrated by the author. And a really interesting aside to this is my son is on the historic uh, committee in our town. And last week he came home, they found a, a group of maps from about the time that we moved in to town here, which is 31 years ago. And looking at these maps, we saw all the places that used to be farmland, even since we've lived here, that have now become developed. And it was just such an interesting, like in your exposition, I was, as I was thinking of this book of what ends up happening, even in a town, how things shape, shift, and change, where affordable housing comes in, or condos come in, or big, you know, uh, big mansions come in, and how that shapes what actually happens in the community, and how much the town has changed over these 31 years, just looking at this little landscape of us, let alone what happened in the modern world. Very, very interesting to think about. Now we've got a book, A True Story of Love and Friendship. It's called When Harry Met Minnie, and it's by Martha Teichner. She is a CBS uh, correspondent. Um, she, it is also narrated by her. There's a special camaraderie among early morning dog walkers. As fate would have it, Martha knew someone who was dying of cancer from exposure to to toxins after 9-11 and was desperate to find for her, a home for her dog, Harry. He was a bull terrier, the same breed as Martha's dear Minnie. Would Martha consider giving Harry a safe, loving new home? After Martha agrees to meet Harry and his owner, Carol, what begins as a transaction involving a dog becomes a deep and meaningful friendship between two women with complicated lives and a love of bull terriers in common. Through the heartbreaking grief of uh, Carol's illness, the bond that develops changed Martha's life, Carol's life, Minnie's life, and Harry's life, and it changed Carol's death as well. So this is when Harry met Minnie. It sounds like it's a wonderful story. I have a copy in the other room. I can't wait to read it. And once again, as I said, narrated by the author. Um, and I'll give you a little sneak peek that we're doing a Valentine's Day promotion. This is in it. Like, you know, a love between the dogs too. Um, we're giving you some March titles to look forward to because we've got what's coming up right now up to about February 2nd, though I snuck a February 9th in there. So let's look ahead to March. Um, I still know that we're still in a time, we're still in pandemic times, even though we have a vaccine and we're moving in the right direction, we're moving slowly in the right direction, maybe towards what I called in the newsletter last week, precedented times. Um, I still think that I'm only thinking about what to eat for dinner tonight. I'm still not making huge weekend plans. We're kind of living in the moment. So that's the reason we're trying to deliver books to you in little, little bundles, because it's really what you can read in the next four weeks. But now you're going to get a sneak peek ahead to what's happening in March. Okay. First is Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. I had the pleasure of hearing her speak about this book. Here's what something is really interesting. It's a slim novel. You now some books are really super bloated. It's not a super bloated book. Started reading it and I'm, I put it aside just because it's not coming out till March and there's a lot to read between now and then, but boy, is it captivating. Talia is being held in a correctional facility for adolescent girls in the forested mountains of Colombia after committing an impulsive act of violence that may or may not have been warranted. 
She urgently needs to get out and get home, back home to Bogota, where her father and a plane ticket to the United States are waiting for her. If she misses her flight, she might also miss her chance to finally be reunited with her family in the North. How this family came to occupy two different countries, two different worlds, comes into focus like the twists of a kaleidoscope. Patricia Engel, herself a dual citizen and the daughter of Colombian immigrants, gives voice to all five family members as they navigate the particulars of their respective circumstances. Will she make it to Bogota in time? If she does, can she bring herself to trade the solid facts of her father and life in Colombia for the distant vision of her mother and siblings in America? Very, very um, gripping cover once again, and I'm looking forward to finishing this one. She, she was absolutely wonderful talking about the book. Next, we've got Isabel Allende, The Soul of a Woman. This is coming on March 2nd. I love Isabel. Um, those of you may remember, I interviewed her a couple of years ago at um, a Simon & Schuster event, and she was just terrific. The woman is blunt and she's forthright, and we just had a fabulous conversation. It's available someplace online. If you Google me and Isabel, I'm sure it's going to come up. So I love the description of this book. When I say I was a feminist in kindergarten, I am not exaggerating, begins Isabel Allende. As a small child, she watched her mother, abandoned by her husband, provide for her three small children without re resources or voice. Isabel became a fierce and defiant little girl, determined for her life, uh, for, or to fight for the life her mother couldn't have. Um, a little aside here, Isabel writes her mother a note every day. She was telling me that when I interviewed her. Every day she sends a note to her mother, a letter, and she sends this off. And it's, so they have this very, very close relationship back and forth. So as a young woman coming of age in the late 1960s, she rode the second wave of feminism. Amongst a tribe of like-minded female journalists, Allende for the first time felt comfortable in her own skin, as they wrote, with a knife between her teeth about women's issues. She's seen what the movement has accomplished in the course of her lifetime, and over the course of three passionate marriages, she's learned how to grow as a woman while having a partner, when to step away, and the rewards of embracing one's sexuality. This book, she hopes, will light the torches of our daughters and granddaughters with mine. They will have to live for us as we live for our mothers and carry on the work that is still left to be finished. So there we've got from Isabel Allende. And if you look at this cover, there's lots going on in the, um, the drawing that's behind the, uh, the title, or the artwork, rather. Okay, now we've got Sparks Like Stars by Nadia Hashimi. And I got to hear Nadia speak about this book um, last week at a, a library presentation. Um, she has written the brilliant books, The Pearl That Broke Its Shell, The Win House Without Windows, and When the Moon Is Low. And in this one, an Afghan-American woman returns to Kabul to learn the truth about her family and the tragedy to destroy their lives. This brilliant and compelling novel from the author of those three, uh, those three uh, books. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I feel that Nadia's got a very, very strong voice um, and I just wanna see what she's written next. Next we've got We Begin at the End by Chris Whitaker. Um, Louise Penny's got a great quote on the top. This is a book to be read and reread and the author is to be celebrated. And I do agree. And while I lamb said it will break readers' hearts, the pleasure of interviewing Chris back in, I think it was November at this point. Um, it's coming out on March 2nd, one on your radar. Uh, his debut author, um, he's also really witty and I'm really looking forward to doing another interview with him because he's great. Um, there are two kinds of families, the ones we're born into and the ones we create. Walk has never left the coastal California town where he grew up. He may have become the chief of police, but he's still trying to heal the old wounds of having given the testimony that sent his best friend, Vincent King, to prison decades before. Now, 30 years later, Vincent is being released. A 40-something-year-old sheriff and a 13-year-old girl may not seem to have a lot in common, but they both have come to expect that people will disappoint you. Loved ones will leave you. If you open your heart, it will be broken. So when trouble arrives with Vincent King, Walk and Duchess find that they will be unable to do anything but usher it in, arms wide closed. We begin at the end as a novel about people who deserve so much more than life serves them. Times devastating with flashes of humor. There is humor and hope throughout. It's ultimately an inspiring tale of how the human spirit prevails and how in the end love in all its different guises wins. So I read the first 50 pages of this book before I interviewed him. I was doing a real pre-publication interview and I can't wait to read more. So I'm looking forward to reading this advance. I'm betting it's going to be a bet's on as well. 
Next, we've got from Lisa Scottolini, Eternal. Now, many of you know Lisa for her uh, thrillers, for her suspense, for her uh, standalone books, her uh, Rosado series, just Okay, let's take her work in a different direction this time, because Lisa has now written historical fiction, and it is brilliant. I absolutely love this book. Picked it as a bet on instantly. I read it in manuscript. Anybody who knows me knows that like printing out pages and reading them is not my favorite thing, but this one I whip through. If you like the kind of friendship that you will see in um, the Elena Ferrante books, if you like a story where you're just going to be completely captivated by character as well as setting and plot, this is the one for you. Elisabetta, Marco, and Sandro grow up best friends despite their differences. Their friendship blossoms to love with both Sandro and Marco, hoping to live Elisabetta's heart. But in the autumn of 1937, all that begins to change as Mussolini asserts his power, alleging Italy's fascists with uh, Hitler's Nazis and altering the very lives that govern Rome. In time, everything that these three hold dear, their young kids remember, their families, their homes, and their connection to one another is tested in ways that you never could have imagined. As anti-Semitism takes legal root and World War II erupts, the threesome recognizes that Mussolini was only the beginning. The Nazis invade Rome, and with their occupation come new atrocities against the city's Jews, culminating in a final horrific betrayal. Against this backdrop, the intertwined tales, fates of Elisabetta, Marco, and Sandro and their families will be decided in a heartbreaking story of both the best and the worst that the world has to offer. Liz has been doing something interesting. She traveled to Italy uh, as she was writing this book, and she took pictures, she took videos of scenes uh, that happened uh, in the places where she was writing. And you know, this would she thought would have been Marco's home. And this is where Sandra would have been. And she's been uh, run, doing a series on Tuesday nights at 7.30 Eastern, where she actually talks about these little one minute videos and then expo uh, um, espouses upon them with uh, talks about how this is going to integrate into her book, where her inspiration was, came from this. Um, and it's interesting for somebody who's written a thriller for so many, so many thrillers to switch genres like this and be so passionate about the writing that she's doing in this new genre. Um, and it's so well done. I, I keep asking her, you know, like, please do another, because what I find is that the history is really, really strong, but so is the storytelling of the people. For those of you who sit there and go, oh, I've already read about World War II. No, this is really a story of people as well. And sometimes it's not just, it's not just caught up in what's going on there, but it's also caught up in the personalities as well. So if you want to check out um, Tuesdays at 7.30, she is doing this and then um, speaking about it afterwards, which is a really, really nice little break in the week. Um, next, we've got A Women in Salt by Gabriela Garcia. This is also going to be a bets on selection. In present day Miami, Jeanette is battling addiction, daughter of Carmen, a Cuban immigrant. She's determined to learn more about her family history from her reticent mother and makes a snap decision to take in the daughter of a neighbor detained by ICE. Um, Carmen, still wrestling with the trauma of displacement, must process her difficult relationship with her own mother while trying to raise the wayward Jeanette. Steadfast in her quest for understanding, Jeanette travels to Cuba to see her grandmother and reckon with secrets from the past destined to erupt. A haunting meditation on the choices of mothers, the legacy of the memories they carry, and the tenacity of women who choose to tell their stories despite those who wish to silence them. A Woman in Salt is more than a, a, a diaspora story. It's a story of America's most tangled, honest human roots. And I just find the voice in this one is so, so well done. I'm so looking forward, March 30th, which is also my anniversary. See, now I know it's on a Tuesday. It's so funny when you see the dates like that. Next from Martha Hall Kelly, who you know as the author of The Lilac Girls, um, is her latest book called Sunflower Sisters. Uh, the, uh, in the uh, million copy Lilac Girls, you were introduced to Caroline Faraday. And now in Sunflower Sisters, Kelly tells the story of Faraday's ancestor, Georgiana Woolsey, a union nurse during the Civil War, whose calling leads her to cross paths with Gemma, a young enslaved girl who is sold off and conscripted into the army, and Anne May Wilson, a Southern plantation mistress whose husband enlists. So um, it's interesting when we were, uh, my book club read uh, Lilac Girls, 
and we actually Skyped her. I don't know what we were doing at the time. No, we weren't Skyping or we something with Martha Hall Kelly. It was, be- it was pre-Zoom days. Remember those days, pre-Zoom like a year ago? So uh, we were chatting with Martha and she was actually talking to us about this book, the plot. She was walking us through everything and she told the group the title and she said, don't tell what the title is. And we all kept it a secret because we were so excited that we knew. Sunflowers are some of my favorite flowers. So it was one that I actually remember the title because I'm terrible at remembering. So um, Sunflower Sisters, she talked a lot with us about her research going down into the um, areas where the Civil War was fought, all the different battles, battle uh, battlegrounds, and um, getting really boots on the ground to her, her research. So looking forward to this one as well. Um, and don't forget these. There are a couple of big authors that we just don't want you to forget their books, but I feel like they don't need, you know, complete descriptions from you because many of them are part of a series. First of all, we got The Scorpion's Tale by Preston and Childs. Next, we've got Spin by Patricia Cornwell. We've got Serpentine by Jonathan Kellerman. We've got um, Someone to Watch Over Me, which is uh, the homage to Robert B. Parker's writing that's being done by Ace Atkins. And we've got The Lost Boys by Faye Kellerman. So there are five books there that we don't want you to forget about. Um, Also, I've got two early book reporter bets on selections. I've already picked two. You've heard a sneak peek at some of the others that are coming up. I've got The Mystery of Mrs. Christie that came out on December 29th. Last week's newsletter, I actually posted a link to uh, where that book was um, discussed on Saturday, CBS This Morning. And The Push by Ashley Audrain, which um, I did an interview with her that just went up on the site, I believe it was last week. And we've got it up on social media this week. If you want to follow us on, uh, we're on, uh, the, uh, Facebook as bookreporter.com and readinggroupguides.com. We always post the um, review, the uh, interviews up there, as well as contest news. And it makes it easy to be able to share those with your friends. If you watch the videos, if you um, listen to the podcast, if we could ask you to share those, um, really important for us. If you could just share them with friends, let people know, you know, pass links along, it'd be really terrific. And also subscribe so that we're able to know that, oh, you know, everybody always wants to know how many subscribers you have. We want to be able to tell them we have them as well. And you can help us do that by subscribing to the video or subscribing to the podcast. And then you'll, as what's the line? You'll never miss an episode. Um, so the book reporter talks to, we did, oh my gosh, so many interviews last year and we've got I don't know, Austin is like really editing quickly because we've got so many that we've got planned for these next couple of weeks and so many exciting things we've got planned for this as well. So we're on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. And our next Bookachino Live event will be on Wednesday, February 10th at two o'clock in the afternoon. And we'll talk about books that are coming out from February 9th through early March. And yes, I'll be giving you a sneak peek of April. So there we go. Um, like I said, we're, gonna, we, we're constantly experimenting. Hey, look, guys, last year, this time, we didn't even know what Zoom was. And we've just pivoted and done so many like really interesting things, including the author interviews. So we're going to see you know, what else we can do. Um, I don't know. We've got plans. We've got plans coming up. And we're also, I'm trying not to do too many different things because we feel like we do the author interviews well. We do the Book of Chino Live. We'll be doing the book club events. We want to stick with what we're doing. You know, Terry, thanks for joining us. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing, you know, if, if, what's effective, what's exactly what people are looking for right now. So if there's anything else we can be doing, we'll be happy to try. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. We will have a video um, of this uh presentation we'll probably stick with doing these even the pandemic's over simply because i think that it's a good way to connect with our readers um well we'll also uh we will be sending out once this link is up and but remember only if you appear today are you able to um enter to win the contest okay thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next month all right bye-bye now